Good evening and welcome to Holy Blossom Temple. My name is Judy Winberg. I am, have the honor of being the president of the board of Holy Blossom Temple and it really is my pleasure to welcome you here tonight. I applaud you on finding the right room because it's never easy and those of us who are here regularly always find it a challenge, but it's worth it once you get here. Uh, not only are our doors always open, our membership is open at Holy Blossom. We have developed a statement of identity here that we like to share with our members and with our visitors. It states, Holy Blossom Temple, Toronto's first synagogue, is a leading Canadian Reformed Jewish congregation with, with a rich history responding to both tradition and modernity in our religious and spiritual experience. We pursue meaningful opportunities for personal growth and family fulfillment at every stage of life through belonging, learning, prayer and ritual, acts of service for our congregation, our community, our city, and our country, the reform movement, Israel, and the world. This evening's presentation by Melanie Phillips, sponsored by the Speakers Action Group, is an example of our commitment to learning. And again, I quote from our statement of identity, we pride ourselves on the breadth and depth of our offerings that we open our doors to the broad and that we open the doors to the broader community to learn with us. And with that, I warmly welcome you to Holy Blossom. We can all come together and learn. One housekeeping item for those who are looking, there are washrooms behind the white panel behind you. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce Daniel Gordman from Speakers Action Group. Hello, everyone. It's great to be here alongside such a great speaker, such as Melanie Phillips. Uh, first, I'm required to do a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, one, we would really appreciate after the event if you would fill out the uh, feedback cards positively. Thank you, Shirley Ann. Uh, another thing, we just if you haven't turned off your cell phones, please turn off your cell phones as that could be annoying. And if you do want to ask questions for Melanie, our speaker, at the end, uh, you were given a card, so just write down your questions and we'll come collect them before the Q&A. All right? So, on behalf of the Speakers Action Group, uh, we would really like to sincerely uh, extend our appreciation to Holy Blossom Temple, as well as the President Judy Winberg and Jeff Denneberg, who will moderate the Q&A. Uh, on behalf of me, I would really like to spank, uh, thank Shirley Ann and the Speakers Action uh, Steering Committee for all the hard work they did behind the scenes to put on this event. Um, so. Some of you might know me, most of you do not. Uh, that is mostly because I recently joined the Speakers Action Group this year as the social, uh, the social media coordinator, not social justice coordinator, that would be bad, that would be very bad. Um, you've probably noticed that I am of a different demographic than the average Speakers Action Group member, all right? I see this as a very good thing though for a Speakers Action Group because although our generations tend to come at issues a little bit differently, uh, we end up being a lot more similar than people think. Take for example Melanie Phillips. Most of you know her as one of the award-winning journalists who used to write for one of those fabled newspapers my parents speak of. If you're like me, you probably know her as the reasonable British one on YouTube. That is, I call it. And events like this are why I'm so happy to be part of Speakers Action Group now, because Speakers Action Group has decades of experience fighting against racism, anti-Semitism, BDS, socialism, cultural relativism, and all other forms of nonsense you learn at university these days. So, I would also like to say that we have some great events coming up recently. We have the March 26th screening of the film The Fight of Our Lives, which Melanie does play a starring role in. So, journalist and movie star. You guys are getting a bargain tonight. Events like, um, so when I started researching Melanie's background for this event, I came, I came across her recent memoir, Guardian Angel, and saw that she had described herself as a liberal that's been mugged by reality. And when I heard that, I realized she is going to be the perfect speaker for this event, and it's going to be so timely, because her story in the late 80s, early 90s of leaving the left is really the story for me and a large part of my generation now. Because when you are my age and you go to school, you start to learn things like Western civilization is rooted in something evil, that the very fundamentals of a society, the values of the Enlightenment, American and French Revolution, the things that have given us such technological and social progress are the things that oppress us. Liberty has been sacrificed to the altar of collectivism. Equality is slowly being replaced with the notion of equity and fraternity 
I don't really think anyone would describe our current political climate as a series of friendly disagreements, to say the least. So what should we do when faced with such problems? I say, look to the example set by our predecessors. Melanie Phillips worked for Inside the Belly of the Beast, writing for The Guardian. And when she saw that her friends had almost willfully started to manipulate the narrative surrounding the state of Israel, instead of taking the path of popularity, she chose moral clarity. Again, in 2006, when the problems of mass migration, Islamization, and the willful blindness of a political class started to rear their head in the UK, she was one of the very few people in Britain to stand up to power when she wrote her book, Londonistan. In 2010, she followed this up with the world turned upside down, the global battle over God, truth, and power. That's why it is an absolute, absolute pleasure for me to share the stage with this woman, because she has in spades what many journalists and public intellectuals lack, courage. That's why I want to take a moment to talk to the news junkies out there like me. If you guys are ever tired of the mainstream media, just do what I do and pop over to MelaniePhillips.com. You can get the truth about the state of Israel, uh, a good, clear look at very complicated issues, and updates on our prime minister's best friends, the Iranians. <laughs> so when you, whether you know her for one of her many appearances on the BBC, read one of her various books, or read her columns that are in the Times of London, The Guardian, The Observer, The Sunday Times, Daily Mail, Jerusalem Post, and The Jewish Chronicle, please help me welcome one of my favorite journalists, Melanie Phillips. Thank you very much indeed, Daniel. I think after that uh, introduction, I think we can all go home, really. Um, I must say, having listened to Daniel, I would quite like to meet this Melanie Phillips. She sounds quite extraordinarily awesome. Um, so I can only offer a pale uh, imitation of this uh, paragon that's been laid before you this evening. But uh, anyway, uh, it's a very great pleasure for me to be here this evening. And thank you so much for inviting me. It's a great privilege uh, to be here and a pleasure to be back in Toronto. I've only fallen over once so far. Uh, I do admire your weather. It makes our weather pale into insignificance as a topic of conversation back in Britain. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about uh, the failure of the West. Um, and I don't need to tell you, I'm sure, that we are living through utterly mad times. Uh, in the West, uh, we're living in a society which is supposedly devoted to reason, to equality, and to freedom, all good things. And in order to subscribe to all these good things that define us in the West, we have thrown away religion, and we have thrown away the moral codes of the Bible, and we have thrown away all those tiresome constraints on behavior that are embedded in those moral codes in the Bible. And I have to say, I'm talking generally about our society, not about individuals. So we have espoused what's called lifestyle choice. We are all each of us, our own moral authority. What is right for me is what is right. We are opposed to hatred. We are opposed to discrimination. We are opposed to war. These are bad things. Western society tells itself that we have become better, kinder, gentler people and a better world. Yet, the opposite seems to be happening, does it not? Look at what's happening on campus. Any ideas that don't conform with the prevailing intellectual and moral author orthodoxy are being shut down. Charles Murray, the controversial thinker whose work on poverty and intelligence has raised a few eyebrows here and there, he was forced out at Middlebury College and harassed when he went to speak at Harvard. The feminist icon Germaine Greer was almost barred from a United Kingdom campus when she observed that a person with male genitalia was a man. She is not allowed to say that anymore, and I hope none of you will do so. In this country, Jordan Peterson was forced to crowdfund his research after his work as a psychology professor was almost shut down when he refused, notably to be told, to alter his use of the personal pronoun at the behest of the gender fluid. And with thugs disrupting and censoring pro-Israel speakers on campus and elsewhere, 
clearly there is no safe space for Jews of a certain persuasion. Far from being rational, all this speaks to a denial of reason itself. For example, on equal pay for women, the fact that women's choices largely determine the disparities that occur is ignored or denied, and you will be no platformed if you say so. On man-made global warming, the evidence that the world was actually hotter in the past and that hotter atmosphere historically preceded carbon dioxide emission rather than the other way around is ignored or denied, and you will be denied a university post if your research should be rash enough to say so. On Israel, the fact that a Palestine state has been repeatedly offered but rejected for war and terror, and that the Jews are the only people for whom the land of Israel was ever their national kingdom, is ignored or denied because everybody knows that the only thing in the way of peace in the Middle East is Benjamin Netanyahu. It's no more rational when it comes to the West defending itself against attack from within or without. From Iran to North Korea to the Palestinians, the West tells itself that everybody can be appeased through concessions and compromises because everybody is rational. The fact that these people are in a state of self-declared war against the free world is denied. And when it comes to the Islamization of the West, not only is this fact denied, but anyone who sounds the alarm about it is vilified as an Islamophobe and denied a platform. So I would suggest that far from being in an age of unparalleled reason, we are living in a world which has turned truth and lies, victim and victimizer, upside down. Language has been hijacked so that words like justice, compassion, in practice have been, come, have been made to mean the opposite. It is a mad Alice in Wonderland situation. It's redolent, in fact, of Kafka. It's redolent of the Soviet Union. And this is no accident. There is a connection between, on the one hand, the rejection of constraints on religion, which the West tells itself is the preeminent reason why we are in an age of reason, and the denial of reason and freedom. Now, I've written about all this broadly in my little memoir, which Daniel was kind enough to mention, Guardian Angel, subtitled, My Journey from Leftism to Sanity. This memoir describes my own trajectory from being, once upon a time, the darling of the left, to being what I now am, a reactionary, authoritarian, right-wing, fascist, insane, Zionist warmonger. I'm glad to see I'm in good company. Once upon a time, I thought the liberal and the liberals and the left were the same thing, that the liberal left is what it calls itself, that the left was liberal. And I thought that the liberal left was on the side of truth and reason, justice and conscience, the defense of the vulnerable against all abuses of power. And what I came to realize in a long and very difficult journey, as I think it's called, was that the liberal left was actually on the wrong side of all these issues. The people with whom I thought I was marching behind the banner to a better world were, were actually defending the world that I wanted to uh, defeat and to overturn and to resist. They were on the wrong side of all these issues. And in practice, they were promoting the very things they purported to despise. This book I was hoping to have on uh, sale here uh, so that you could all rush to buy it. But unfortunately, I was stymied by the forces of leftist reaction. Uh, well, actually, it was a bit more banal than that. It was a muck-up. Um, and um, the books never arrive for reasons which we won't go into, a source of great grief to me. Um, but anyway, no conspiracy here. It was just uh, one of those things that happens. Uh, but it's available in Amazon, uh, so you can all rush off and buy it as soon as I finish speaking. But anyway, how did this state of affairs that I describe in this, through the prism of my own journey, how did this state of affairs, of affairs come about? 
Well, it's a long and complicated story, and I will try to uh, encapsulate it as briefly as I can. So forgive me if I, if, if I don't do justice to the complexity of what I'm dealing with. But basically what happened was, in my view, that after two world wars, the West broadly became absolutely demoralized in every sense. The Holocaust was the knockout blow at the very heart of uh, Western uh, uh, reason. Uh, the, almost the epicenter of uh, European cultural civilization. Uh, this terrible, unconscionable thing happened called the Holocaust. And I think the West, broadly speaking, lost confidence in everything the West thought it was. And that kind of is underpinning everything I'm about to say. And what happened was that uh, uh, it's, the West threw over through a process which actually long predated, I think, the two world wars but the world wars gave it a kind of acceleration. The West threw over, as I've said before, biblically based religion uh, and moral constraints for freedom and what the West called human rights. And basically the West decided that in one box was something called religion, in which box was all bad things. It was lack of education, obscurantism, superstitious mumbo jumbo, irrationality, authoritarianism and all bad things, um, and the world going backwards, and in the other box was all good things, marked secularism, denial of religion, secularism, conscience, progress, reason, education, freedom, and human rights. And those basically are the two boxes that obtain today in the, wor in the worldview of the people who control our culture, the intelligentsia, the people who actually uh, think and talk and determine how we all behave. So this animus against religion, I think, can be traced back to what is considered the birthplace of Western reason, the 18th century enlightenment. Well, actually, I would suggest it's not the Enlightenment that's the problem, it's specifically the French Enlightenment. Because in England and Scotland, the Enlightenment developed the concepts of reason and political liberty within the framework of biblical belief. But in France, by contrast, anti-clericalism, the reaction against the church, developed into a much more fundamental hostility to Christianity and to religion itself. Thinkers like Voltaire wanted to replace religion with the secular religion or the secular worship of reason. But this enlightenment did not remove religion so much as pervert it. It took what was at one time in medieval times, the fantasy of medieval Christians, that the perfection of the world was at hand. God's kingdom was about to emerge on earth. It took that medieval Christian fantasy and it secularized it. So reason would create the perfect society. Instead of the kingdom of God being created on earth, perfection would arise through the kingdom of man on earth. And just like medieval Christian belief, this secular doctrine of perfection on earth, utopia, would be unchallengeable and heretics, those who dissented from this, would be punished. It is remarkable how the secularization of this belief has followed the template of medieval uh, Christianity in the persecution of dissenters. Far from utopia, this thinking has resulted in something more akin to hell on earth. For the worship of man through reason led straight to the three great tyrannical movements that spun out of Enlightenment thinking, the French Revolution, communism, and fascism, all in a line. For the French revolutionaries, their millennial hope, the idea of millenarianism, the perfection of, of the world, their millennial hope lay not in scripture, but in egalitarianism. On November the 10th, 1793, the Committee of Public Safety in France, abolished the worship of God and substituted for it the cult of reason. At the same time, this same committee of 12 men summarily were executing thousands of people in the terror, 
which only ended with the execution of its two masterminds, Robespierre and Saint-Just, in 1794. Scroll on, the great thinkers, Kant and Hegel, developed the notion that historical process drove towards a form of collective, secular salvation. Karl Marx offered a further variant on this that would create collective salvation through communism. Both communism and fascism attempted to transform the world to create a perfected society. Fascism was about creating the perfect man. Both ideologies were deprived of their power with the defeat of Nazi Germany and the discrediting of Stalinism and the subsequent fall of the Soviet Union. But the secular belief that man could perfect the world in his own image and in ways that would brook no dissent mutated in the latter half of the 20th century into what the, into what the thinker J.E. Talmon called cultural totalitarianism. The oppression of the individual, the deprivation of individual freedom through the culture. And this is how it has been done. In the 1960s, the baby boomer generation bought heavily into the idea popularized by Herbert Marcuse and other Marxist radicals that the way to transform the West lay not through the seizure of political or economic control. You could wait forever for the workers to rise up. It would never happen, they thought, quite right. It could happen instead through the transformation of the culture. This has been achieved, I would suggest, over the past half century through what's been called the long march through the institutions, the infiltration into all the institutions of the culture, the universities, the media, the professions, politics, the civil service, the churches, of ideas that would then become the orthodoxy, ideas that were deeply and profoundly and innately subversive of core Western values. From multiculturalism to environmentalism, from post-nationalism to human rights doctrine, Western progressives have fixated upon universalizing ideas which reject values anchored in the particulars of religion or culture. And like all utopian projects, which are by definition impossible and unattainable, these dogmas are enforced through coercion, bullying, intimidation, character assassination, professional and social exclusion. The core doctrine is what's called equality. But this is not the equality that comes from the Bible. It is not real equality, which holds, as the Bible has it, that every human being is owed equal respect because every human being is formed in the image of God. The new equality, the secular equality, has been redefined as what I would call identicality, the insistence that there can be no hierarchy of values, of lifestyles, or of cultures. There can be no longer different outcomes depending on different circumstances or how people behave. To differentiate at all is to be bigoted and on a fast track back to fascism and war. But without differentiation between good and bad, between values that are better than others, it is better to respect women as equals than not, for example. Without discrimination, uh, you get no freedom and no equality at all. So, what happened as a result? The married family was kicked off its perch as the normative form of household organization. Sexual restraint was abolished. Behavior that was once frowned upon or even outlawed became the new normal. Education could no longer transmit a culture, Western culture, down through the generations, but had to teach instead that the Western nation was innately racist and exploitative. Feelings trumped facts and evidence. What I feel is what matters and will take precedence over what you feel or what you say is true. There was no longer any absolute truth. Only a fool thinks there is such a thing as absolute truth. Everyone could arbitrate their own truth. That way, bigotry and prejudice would be excised from the human heart. The oppressed of the developing world would be forced, would be freed 
from their Western oppressors, and instead of the Western nation, boo, hiss, bad, racist, exploitative, there would instead be the brotherhood of man. All distinctions would be obliterated. Everybody would be equal. No bad, no good, brotherhood of man. That's what that means. As John Lennon said, imagine. At the heart of this lay the attack on Western values and the Western nation that embodies those values. The Western nation was deemed to be innately exclusive of others because it was rooted in its own particular history, culture, traditions, literature, religion, and all the rest of it. So anybody who wasn't part of that uh, was excluded, and therefore it was racist and oppressive. So what was better was to avoid all that. You had to eradicate the differences between cultures and nations. So national identity was bad. National parliaments, I mean, really so passé, so much to do with oppressing others. No, no, what you had to have was transnationalism, nations coming together so that they were no longer nations, transnational laws like international human rights law, transnational institutions like the sacred United Nations, without whose say-so nobody can ever go to war ever again, the sacred European Union, without which there would be fascism again in Europe, the sacred doctrine of human rights dis disengaged from biblical human rights, because as we all know, biblical human rights merely oppressed other people. What we need is real human rights invented by men and women and arbitrated by men and women. That's real human rights, and these are all superior. International, transnational, globalized doctrines institutions would all trump the Western nation and the particulars of Western culture. War was replaced by law. Only cretins and savages and psychopaths would ever go to war under any circumstances. Civilized people didn't do war ever. Civilized people always sat down and divided up the argument between good and evil you split the difference. That's how civilized people behave. You don't defeat evil. You split the difference. Everyone knows that. Anybody who said war was necessary to defeat evil, as in Iran, was a warmonger. War was replaced by conflict resolution, peace processes, and negotiation. Everyone in the world was assumed to be a rational actor, amenable to appeals to reasonable self-interest even if they were deranged fanatics. The only deranged fanatic was somebody who said you had to go to war with Iran. This is, of course, in my view, a profoundly irrational set of beliefs, but it was all said and done in the name of freedom, reason, and enlightenment, and in opposition to religion, the supposed source of all oppression, irrationality, and obscurantism. Now, at the heart of all this was an onslaught against the moral codes of Christianity which underpin Western civilization. But here's the thing. Christianity rests in turn on the moral codes of the Hebrew Bible. Jesus, after all, was a Jew. And it is Judaism, the mothership of Christianity, which laid down the moral law which placed constraints upon personal behavior in the interests of others. A revolutionary creed at the time, which forms the very foundation of Western morality, putting others first. That's what the West does. Although Christianity embedded those laws into Western society, it is those mosaic codes themselves which are the real target of the onslaught upon sexual con continence, upon duty, and upon the notion of truth. If you doubt that, consider, for example, what Professor Richard Dawkins, the noted atheist, wrote in his book, The God Delusion. Quote, the God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction, jealous and proud of it, a petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. And that was on a good day. 
This near pathological hatred is based on a wildly untrue, ignorant, and perverse reading of the Hebrew Bible as a handbook of genocide, enslavement, world domination, and racial exclusivism, whereas actually the Hebrew Bible is the origin of the doctrine of loving your neighbor as yourself and laying down codes of behavior that put the interests of others first. And this surely gets really to the heart of this hatred. For in order to protect others, the moral laws of the Hebrew Bible put constraints on individual behavior in order to benefit the wider community. But the first commandment of the secular cultural revolution is to remove all constraints on the individual whose own wants and desires and feelings are now deemed to have precedence over any external constraints or rules. So, biblical ideas were replaced by man-made ideas. Now, we call these ideas, man-made ideas, ideologies, which are given the status of unchallengeable doctrine. An ideology is basically an unchallengeable idea. Ideologies, therefore, inescapably destroy reason. Why? Because they reshape reality. The idea carries all before it. Nothing can challenge the idea. So if somebody comes along and says, excuse me, here are a few facts which challenge your ideology. No, 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 that cannot be. The idea is perfect. The idea cannot be challenged. And so the reality has to be reshaped to fit the governing idea. And so factual evidence or logic are therefore an impediment to ideology. But without factual evidence or logic, there can be no exercise of reason. So ideologies, ideas that carry all before them, must therefore be innately hostile to reason. But we are living in an age of ideologies, secular ideas which carry all before them. And it's a remarkable fact that every single one of these ideologies that forms today's orthodoxy and that, in my view, distorts truth, reality, or morality, is, happens to be, by an amazing chance, innately hostile to Jewish values, the Jewish people, or the state of Israel. Consider ideologies. Anti-capitalism. Anti-capitalism involves the belief that the Jews are behind capitalism. The Jews run the money markets of the world. Anti-Americanism. This involves that belief that the Jews run the money markets of the world, plus the belief that the Jews control American foreign policy in their own interests. That's what lies behind anti-Americanism. In Britain, when 9-11 happened, people looked down and muttered, Israel, America had it coming to it. Why? Why did America have 9-11 coming to it? Because it supported Israel. And Israel was a source of world problems because Israel oppresses the Palestinians. That's how that worked in Britain. That's what anti-Americanism is. The Jews control American foreign policy in a conspiracy stretching from Jerusalem to Washington. It was said in print by mainstream politicians, no problem. Egalitarianism. This involves denying the responsibility for individual behavior. Egalitarianism means nobody can be judged according to how they behave. Everybody has to have the same outcomes, regardless of how they behave or regardless of their circumstances. So it involves denying individual responsibility for your behavior. Multiculturalism denies the superiority of society based on biblical laws over societies that are not. Environmentalism, I'm sure dear to many of your hearts, and we're all environmentalists, we should all care about safeguarding our environment. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about deep green environmentalism, which is based on an understanding or a belief which attacks the account in the book of Genesis of the formation of the world in which the dominion of mankind over the earth is deemed to be an example of divine imperialism or divine colonialism, which must be destroyed by removing man from his position as the pinnacle of creation and substituting the natural world in, its, in his place. Scientism, another ideology, scientism, the belief that materialism, what we see, the, 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 the material world, that materialism is the explanation for absolutely everything in the world, the universe, and beyond, including the origin of the universe. It has a materialist explanation. 
it can be seen by science. It denies the biblical belief that the origin of all matter inescapably lies beyond matter. And of course, anti-Zionism is the denial of the right of the Jewish people to self-determination in their ancestral homeland. All these things are anti-Jews, Jewish religion, Jewish people, state of Israel, remarkable. From man-made global warming to Israel, from the United States foreign policy to the origin of the universe, the West has replaced truth by ideology. And now the West is facing an external enemy from aggressive jihadi Islamism. In the Islamist onslaught, the West is confronting an ideology which hijacks evidence and distorts and falsifies it for its own ends. But as I've already indicated to you, the West has been doing precisely the same thing to itself for decades. The similarities between Western progressives and the Islamists are really remarkable. Both Western progressives and Islamists are attempting to create utopias to redeem past sins of mankind. Both Western progressives and Islamists permit no dissent from the one revealed truth. Both Western progressives and Islamists demonize and seek to suppress their opponents. Both Western progressives and Islamists project their own bad behavior onto others. Both Western progressives and Islamists are currently consumed by paranoid conspiracy theories. Both involve a wholesale repudiation of reason. The West has gone down this road in order to allow the full and unimpeded flowering of the individual and his or her needs and desires. The Islamists have gone down this road to subjugate the individual in submission to religious dogma. What they also have in common, the Western progressives and the Islamists, is a hostility to Judaism, to Israel, and or the Jewish people. The genocidal hatred of Israel and the Jews that drives the Islamic Jihad against the West is not acknowledged or counted by the West because its most high-minded citizens share at least some of that prejudice. Think about it. Both Western liberals and Islamists believe in utopias to which the Jews are an obstacle. The state of Israel is an obstacle to both the rule of Islam over the earth and a world where there are no divisions based on religion or creed. The Jews are an obstacle to the unconstrained individualism of Western libertines, and they're an obstacle to the onslaught against individual human dignity and freedom by the Islamists. Both the liberal utopias of a world without young believers, sorry, both the liberal utopias of a world without prejudice divisions or war, and the Islamist utopia of a world without unbelievers are universalist ideologies, and the people who are always in the way of any universalizing utopia are the Jews. Now, what is even less understood is that the onslaught upon the values of the Hebrew Bible is actually an onslaught on the sources of Western reason itself. Far from religion being the enemy of reason and science, the Hebrew Bible is actually its foundation stone. At this point, when I say this to secularists, they faint. The popular belief is that the roots of science lie in ancient Greece. In fact, Greek thinking ran contrary to a rational view of the universe. The Greeks, whose own universe was an endless cycle of progress and decay, and which transformed heavenly bodies into actual gods, explained the natural world by abstract general principles. Socrates thought empirical observation, observation of reality. He thought that was a waste of time, and Plato advised his students to, quote, leave the starry heavens alone. For the development of science, monotheism was essential. As the Oxford professor of mathematics, John Lennox, puts it, quote, at the heart of all science lies the conviction that the universe is orderly, close quote. Now, this absolutely fundamental insight came not from the Greeks, but thousands of years previously in the Hebrew Bible, with its revolutionary proposition that the universe was governed by a single god rather than the whims of many gods. Science grew from the novel idea that the universe was rational. That belief was given to us by Genesis, which set out the proposition that the universe had a rational creator. Without such a purposeful intelligence behind it, the universe could not have been rational, and so there would have been no place for reason in the world because there would have been no natural laws or truths for reason to uncover. 
by contrast, atheism holds that the world comes from a random and therefore irrational source. So reason, in the worldview of the atheist, is an accidental byproduct. It's atheism, therefore, that is innately hostile to reason. And it was, therefore, religious people, such as the early Christian thinkers Anselm of Canterbury and Thomas Aquinas, who propounded the view that there were comprehensible laws in nature which could only have come from a rational creator. And that's why many scientists from the earliest times onwards have been Christians and Jews. It's why Francis Bacon said God had provided us with two books, the book of nature and the Bible, and that to be properly educated, one must study both. It's why Isaac Newton believed the biblical account of creation had to be read and understood why Descartes justified his search for natural laws on the grounds that they must exist because God was perfect and so acts in a manner as constant and immutable as possible, except for the rare exception of miracles. Why the German astronomer Johannes Kepler believed that the goal of science was to discover within the natural world the rational order which has been imposed on it by God. And why Galileo Galilei said that the laws of nature are written by the hand of God in the language of mathematics. As C.S. Lewis wrote, men became scientific because they expected law in nature, and they expected law in nature because they believed in a lawgiver. The mathematician from Oxford, John Lennox, writes that faith always played a foundational role in science for precisely this reason. Dawkins, says Lennox, is simply wrong. Faith is simply inseparable from the scientific endeavor. Gödel's second theorem in mathematics gives further evidence for this. You cannot even do mathematics without faith in the consistency of mathematics, and it has to be faith because the consistency of mathematics cannot be proved. The further point of great significance, however, is that it was not religion in general but the Hebrew Bible in particular that gave rise to science. And that's because of the revolutionary nature of its propositions about creation. The Hungarian Benedictine priest Stanley Jakey has shown that in seven great cultures, Chinese, Hindu, Mayan, Egyptian, Babylonian, Greek, and Arabic, the development of science was truncated. All of these made discoveries which carried human understanding forward many discoveries, but none of them was able to keep its scientific discoveries going. And Jakey attributes that to two critical features. First, science could only proceed on the basis that the universe was rational and coherent, and thus nature behaved in accordance with unchanging laws, and that was impossible under pantheism, which ascribed natural events to the whims and caprices of the spirit world. The other vital factor was the Bible's linear concept of time. This meant history was progressive. Time moved in a line. Every, con every event was therefore significant. Experience could be built upon. Progress was thus made possible. And you could learn more about the laws of the universe and how it worked through studying that progress. Embodied in the great medieval universities founded by the church, Faith and the power of reason accordingly infused Western culture and stimulated the rise of science. Now, it's undoubtedly the case that both Christianity and Judaism have struggled and struggle today to reconcile reason with revelation. And without doubts, without doubt, there have been and still are deep conflicts between modernity and Jewish religious thinking, just as there have been such conflicts between modernity and Christianity. I would suggest, though, that Christianity is rather more vulnerable to the attack upon religion from secularism than its Jewish parent. And that's because, I suggest, because of the intrinsic differences between their respective claims to reason and to rationality. Judaism can lay reasonable claim to being the most rational of all religions. First of all, it asserted an orderly universe. It invented it. Unlike Christianity, However, Judaism is also all about this world, not the next, and it's firmly grounded in man's deeds, in historical memory, and in the here and now. It's not concerned with proving the existence of God. As the thinker Eliezer Berkowitz has observed, the foundation of Judaism 
is not that God is, but that he cares about mankind and the world. That concern is made known through the encounter between man and God. The Hebrew Bible is not a textbook of philosophy or metaphysics, but a record of man's encounter with God. Jews are not taught, this is what we believe. They are taught, this is what happened to us. They're not taught dogma, but they're taught remembered collective experience. Faith and experience in Judaism are therefore indissolubly linked. At Sinai, the children of Israel are described as seeing and hearing the revelation of God's commandments. The biblical account does not try to describe God, but describes a participatory event that is said to have happened. So the big question is, did it happen? Well, those who don't believe God exists say it couldn't have happened. But Judaism proceeds on the basis that what the evidence suggests is most likely to have happened is, therefore, what is most likely to have happened. And Berkowitz observes, according to the logic of Immanuel Kant himself, the non-existence of God cannot be proved any more than his existence can be proved. But the encounter with God in the Bible was witnessed by the prophets of Israel, men of unimpeachable integrity and courage, and more important, the entire Jewish nation experienced this encounter through the Exodus, the revelation at Sinai, and the journey through the wilderness. The experience of that sustained encounter was so seismic that it defined the, ex the existence of the Jewish people and has caused it never to surrender to other cultures despite unparalleled attempts ever since to eradicate it. The evidence would therefore seem to support the idea that what was said to have happened was more likely than not, broadly speaking, actually to have happened. And although as the theologian Rodney Stark has observed, commitment to the progressive reasoning of God's will requires Christians to accept the Bible is not or not always to be understood literally. Christians also accept that it's not necessarily literally true. Christianity nevertheless does depend for its core beliefs upon the truth of supernatural events for which there is only fragile supporting evidence. Much more thus devolves onto pure faith unmediated by the conceits of metaphor or symbol. And that's much harder to sustain under the onslaught from secularism and materialism. But in Judaism, by contrast, many biblical miracles are explained as either natural events or metaphor metaphorical illusions. In the 12th century, the great Jewish sage Moses Maimonides wrote his Guide of the, of the Perplexed precisely to explain that there was no contradiction between rationalism and the Hebrew Bible. He argued, for example, that the Torah was full of similes which were not to be taken at face value as the literal truth. The Bible's enigmatic and poetic text makes little sense if read literally. Genesis, for example, is filled with contradictions which demand sophisticated analysis. In the 12th century, Maimonides was the classic exponent of the idea that metaphysical truths could only be grasped through the exercise of reason. He held that religion was the highest rung of metaphysical knowledge. Human perfection, he said, consisted in the attainment of rational virtues, the conception of ideas which lead to correct opinions of metaphysical matters. So for Maimonides, only someone who has mastered all the disciplines of human knowledge, such as logic, mathematics, and natural science, only that person could attain knowledge of God. Concentrating the intellect in this way was the highest form of spirituality. Even living according to the laws of Moses was secondary to the intellectual service of God through contemplation and study. That's why even though doing good works and promoting the repair of the world are certainly stressed in Judaism as amongst the very highest moral imperatives, the very highest calling in Judaism is to learn. According to the Catholic theologian and cardinal Henri de Lubac, the God of the Hebrew Bible liberated humanity from being the plaything of the gods or passive victims of fate as they were in classical or Eastern antiquity to become masters of their destiny and bend history in a humane direction. But what biblical man perceived as liberation, today's proponents of atheistic humanism perceive it as bondage. For secularists to be great as a human being, for humanity to achieve greatness, 
requires the rejection of God as a program to remake the world. And Henri de Lubac concluded, quote, it is not true, as it is sometimes said, that man cannot organize the world without God. What is true is that without God, he can only organize it against man. The result has been, I would suggest, the tyrannical ideologies of the modern age, which has forgotten that the rationality upon which it prides itself and the science that flows from that rationality owe their existence not to secularism, not to the repudiation of religion, but to religion itself. And the result of this amnesia or denial is the repudiation not just of reason, but of humanity itself. As Pope Benedict XVI wrote, quote, the radical detachment of the Enlightenment philosophy from its roots ultimately leads it to dispense with man, close quote. Abolishing the biblical God has abolished the rationality and freedom bestowed in his name. For the outcome of dispatching religion in the name of reason is that the West has become very much more open to unreason. While scorning biblical religion as superstitious and irrational voodoo, our society now promotes such nonsenses as paganism, pantheism, witchcraft, parapsychology, healing crystals, new age spirituality. And it's also heaving with conspiracy theories ranging from MI5 involvement in Princess Diana's death to America having committed the 9-11 attacks itself to the world being run by the Illuminati, the Bilderberg Group and the Jews. This all shows the truth, does it not, of the saying by G.K. Chesterton, when men choose not to believe in God, they do not thereafter believe in nothing. They then become capable of believing in anything. The point is that I'm making here is that people have a predilection to believe. They search constantly for something beyond themselves, for a meaning to their lives, for answers to the why questions on which science and materialism and secularism have absolutely nothing to say. The marginalization of biblical religion has created a vacuum which has been filled by real superstitious mumbo jumbo and magical thinking. And it's also created an opportunity for radical Islamists because they understand very well indeed the spiritual whole at the heart of the West. They understand that without religious belief to underpin a society's values, that society is nothing, which is why they have targeted the West for cultural colonialist takeover. And is also why, in my opinion, Britain, the very heart of secularist denial of religion, is the principal target of targets and, simultaneously, the principal recruiting ground. As Winston Churchill observed, when he reflected on the threat posed by the Islamic world, because he certainly saw it as a threat, quote, were it not that Christianity is sheltered in the strong arms of science, the science against which it had vainly struggled, the civilization of modern Europe might fall, as fell the civilization of ancient Rome. So in conclusion, is it all over for the West? Just to cheer you up. <laughs> well, not quite. I have been known for years as Cassandra, uh, people have left my talks wanting basically to throw themselves off the cliff, or so I'm led to believe. But since the 23rd of June, 2016, Cassandra has been turned into Pollyanna. What was 23rd of June, 2016? That was the date of Britain's EU referendum, in which by 52% to 48%, Britain voted for Brexit to leave the European Union. And that was followed in a, within a few months by the hardly less seismic development of the election as president of the United States of Donald J. Trump. Now, although the context of these two developments is, was very different, I would suggest that very similar motives lay behind both of them. It was, in short, a very profound desire indeed for both Britain and America in different circumstances and with different expressions a very deep desire for Britain and America to reaffirm their national identities, to reaffirm their historic culture and bedrock values that all citizens could share, to restore democratic self-government in Britain and the rule of law and the constitution in the United States to uphold those values, to defend their nation from those trying to destroy it both from within and from without, 
and to be proud of their nation and what it stood for again, and not to be ashamed of being proud of it. In other words, what lay behind both those developments in their different ways was an absolute repudiation of the anti-Western, anti-reason mindset I've been describing this evening. And tens of millions of people voted that way. Far from be my being a lone voice, as my critics would have it, tens of millions of people thought broadly like me. All those years, I had been told, you're on your own, you're insane, you're extreme, no one thinks like you, uh, there is no one like you, uh, the, the, your, your views are completely off the wall. All those years, people were watching and listening to what was being told to them and what was being told them and what they thought, and they were forming their own conclusion, and out it came. Vote for Britain's values again as a democratic, self-governing nation according to Western values and British national identity. Vote for Donald Trump and make America great again. And look at what the reaction was. Because now the fight is on in both countries to reverse Brexit and to destroy Trump. And it is a fight to the death. People who think like this, all those tens of millions who voted in that way in both countries, are described in almost identical language as nativists, as ethno-nationalists, as followers of the Ku Klux Klan, as fascists, as Nazis, as anti-Semites, as anti-human. All those millions and millions of people who voted for Brexit and for Trump are described in that way. So it's a fight to the death because much, much, much more is at stake here than just leaving the European Union in Britain or the character of Donald J. Trump. Because whatever his flaws, and there are many, and don't get me started on that, he believes in America and its people and he will fight for them. And that is what people understand he is fundamentally about. Correspondingly, those in Britain who voted Brexit believe in Britain and would fight for it. Brexit was the first great reversal ever for the anti-Western ideology I've been talking about, and Trump's election was an even greater blow against it. And the result is the unprecedented attempt to smear the people who voted in this way and to thwart their democratic will, an unprecedented struggle which is now underway on both sides of the Atlantic, and who knows what will be the outcome on either side of the Atlantic. I certainly don't know and would not put money on it. If President Trump survives as a political leader, and if Brexit actually happens, then I believe the West has a chance of surviving. I put it as starkly as that. A chance of surviving because it would mean the reassertion of belief in the Western nation, and that reassertion of belief in the Western nation, I suggest, would in itself deal a very powerful blow to these ideologies that I've been talking about, and also to the hatred of Israel, the quintessential ethnic nation. In mainland Europe itself, there's this great upsurge of similar sentiments. They want to express their historic cultures and rule themselves in accordance with those cultures. A great upsurge of this sentiment expressing itself in voting for parties, political parties in mainland Europe committed to escaping the European Union on the one hand and dealing with Islamization on the other. Now, some of these parties are decent and patriotic parties. They are smeared as being fascist and Nazi, but some of them are fascist and Nazi and anti-Semitic and racist. And it's a mess, uh, and there are both sorts going on, but behind both of those sets of parties, whether they're good or bad, behind, what's, uh, what's, what's giving them traction is that fundamentally the people of mainland Europe will not let their civilization go without a fight. The fight may well be bloody and terrible, and who knows what the outcome will be, but it will be a fight. But I would suggest finally, 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 that Western civilization will only be rescued if it reaffirms the religious roots that underpin it and give its beliefs coherence. That means reaffirming Christianity, and it also means reaffirming or affirming the roots of Christianity in the Hebrew Bible. 
Many church leaders in Britain and the West flinch from delivering a robust religious message because they think it's simply impossible to counter the evidence of materialism with the unprovable mysteries of religious faith. Well, I think that's the wrong way to approach this. I think there's a better way to approach it. As I've suggested, our secular age has not renounced spirituality or belief in six impossible things before breakfast. It would be very nice if it's going to believe in six impossible things before breakfast, that it believes in the six impossible things that underpin our civilization, rather than the six impossible things that actually will destroy our civilization. But it has not renounced belief in something beyond themselves. What it's renounced is Christianity, and that has sent what is people's unending spiritual quest down unhealthy and absurd cul-de-sacs of belief in parapsychology, healing crystals, and all the rest of it. The way to approach people, I would suggest, is to answer directly that yearning for meaning. That means not pinning everything on belief in supernatural events, nor on the need to adhere to the moral rules of the Bible, nor the formalities of sacramental, belief, of sacramental behavior, religious rituals, whether Jewish or Christian. I'm not for a moment suggesting those things aren't terribly important. I'm suggesting it's putting the cart before the horse when dealing with a civilization which has lost the religious plot. All of that should come later, after the explanation of why what the Bible contains is so important to people's lives, their happiness, and welfare on this earth. Because I think people need to be made aware that the values they most deeply cherish rationality, reason, conscience, the dignity of every human being, human rights, making the world a better place, that these things that they think come from the secular, secularism, they come from repudiation of the Bible, they need to be made aware they come from the Bible, and that without that basic faith, those values will disappear. They need to be made aware that this is the foundation stone of science. It's not the repudiation of science. Without it, science wouldn't have existed. And that the Bible's governing idea that the origin of everything lies in a mystery that by definition exists beyond the reach of science is the least unlikely explanation for everything. They need to be shown how attaching themselves to these values can enrich their own lives. And to use this approach, which is most likely to penetrate and undermine the secularists' own defenses, the Christian churches have to explicitly reconnect to and reaffirm their roots in the Hebrew Bible. They have to reaffirm their links to Judaism, their parent religion, which so many churches have preferred to push aside. And you can see the results, and they're very dramatic. You've only got to look at the differences, for example, between Britain and Europe on the one hand, and America on the other, to see what's happened. In Britain and Europe, where the churches have largely lost their connection with Judaism and the Hebrew Bible, and are correspondingly much more hostile to Jewish peoplehood in the state of Israel, the pews of those churches are empty. Christianity is dying, and their civilization is dying with it. In America, in the great central heartland, which is filled with scripturally faithful evangelical churches, which are bursting with energy, and they form a bulwark in this titanic fight going on there against secular ideologies. Now, those churches have an uphill struggle, to put it mildly, but at least they are taking the fight to the enemy because without that connection with Judaism, Christianity is nothing. And without Christianity, the West will become something very different indeed. So the key to the defense of the West lies in the religion that underpins it. And the key to enlisting the army that will defend the West lies in the roots of that religion. It's quite simple, it's pretty obvious. All that's needed is the will to see it. Thank you very much indeed.
and perhaps some people can come around and, and pick up the cards and we will do the questions that way. So while that is happening, I will take this opportunity to ask a question to Ms. Phillips. Melanie. Melanie. The second intifada from, uh, at least from this side of the ocean, it appeared that all of the main journals of Europe were falling over themselves to see who could be the most severe critic of Israel during that period. And it wasn't just being critical of the actions, there seemed to be a obsession with, with making Israel appear to be morally deficient, even morally evil. There seemed to be that obsession. And, and the level of that obsession was really astonishing. It was perhaps the most astonishing aspect of it was, was the level of that apparent obsession. So you've talked a bit about that tonight. If you have anything more to say about that, I'm interested. And as well, I'm interested to know what, um, you know, how that part played in your personal journey in terms of your level, the type of understanding that you've described this evening. Um, well, I'll deal with the personal journey first, um, because I'm most interested in my personal journey. Um, uh, the issue of Israel played a, a fairly important uh, role in it, uh, in one particular respect. Um, for various reasons, including a fear of flying, um, I didn't ever go to Israel until the year 2000. Uh, which uh, strikes people as rather surprising since I am, as we all know, an extremist, fanatic, Likudnik, Zionist, warmonger. Um, and um, nevertheless, in 1982, something happened when I was working at The Guardian, which um, uh, acted as a kind of line that I crossed without my realizing it. In 1982, um, Israel was enmeshed in its war in the Lebanon, and there was a lot of bad feeling about that, and I wasn't very sure what I thought about it, but I didn't like what Israel was doing because I thought it was very ill-advised, but I understood that the reason why it was doing it was because it was trying to defend itself against Palestinian terrorism. Um, but I was very, very troubled by the reaction to the Lebanon war in Britain, and particularly at the Guardian, Guardian shrine of anti-racism, reason, balance, fairness, and all good things. And I couldn't understand why The Guardian was um, devoting so much attention of the most hysterical and unpleasant kind to what Israel was doing in the Lebanon, while virtually ignoring what Assad the father was doing in Syria. Uh, there was one period uh, where it was, I think it was over a week, two weeks, three weeks, a short period where Assad, the father, caused something between 10 and 40,000 um, of his opponents to be uh, killed. And it was dealt with very briefly down the paper, on the foreign page, a few paragraphs. And I wondered to my colleagues, I was then writing editorials at the time, and I wondered aloud to them in a spirit of complete innocence. I wasn't the same person then as I am now. I said, why, is there, why do we seem to have a double standard? I mean, all this shouting and screaming about Israel, but yet Syria has just killed in tens of thousands of people. And, you know, there are no screaming op-eds. There, no you know, there are no editorials denouncing it. There's no front page splash headlines. Why does there seem to be a double standard? I said, in all innocence. And there was a terrible silence, and they all looked at me, and they said, well, of course, it's a double standard. You don't expect us to treat the developing world by the same standards that we live by. We are brought up to believe in the dignity of every human being. We have respect for human life. We have respect for human rights. They don't. They don't know what these things are. So we can't judge them by our standards. That's racism. And I said, so you're telling me that if somebody's unfortunate enough to be born into the developing world, they're not entitled to the same rights to life and liberty as we are? Isn't that racism? And they said, 
Why are you so upset? And then they said, we do you the great honor, and I became you. That moment, I became you. We do you the great honor of assuming that you, by which they meant the state of Israel, and I'd never been even to the state of Israel, we do you the great honor of assuming that you share our values, that you have the same values as we do. So we judge you by our standards. We judge them by their standards. We judge you by our standards. And what's more, they said, you tell us that you are morally superior to us, so we should judge you by higher standards. And at that point, I realized two things. I realized that I had crossed a line. At that stage in my life, I didn't understand the line I'd crossed, but I knew that I crossed it. And I knew there was no going back from it. I knew that then I'd become you. I, I was we, I become you. And the second thing that I realized was that I could never trust their moral judgment again. I hadn't begun to put together what I then put together over many years. So it may strike you as rather boneheaded of me that I didn't immediately realize quite every, you know, everything, but I didn't. Um, but I did realize that where I had believed that we were all basically on the same side, we weren't. That there was something profoundly, morally corrupted and wrong at the heart of what they believed. And so, you know, that's where the issue of Israel was a fairly important marker. You ask a very difficult question, quite why the media are so obsessed. Um, it's not just the media. The media are obsessed because the intellectual world, the intellectual elites are obsessed. The media is simply the public arm of the intelligentsia. Why are they obsessed? Mainly because they are overwhelmingly left-wing and what happened to the left over the, the last few decades is that it severed its roots in uh, Christian belief, certainly in Britain, and it got overtaken by simple Marxism. Um, and, you know, at the heart of Marxism is a hatred of Jews and all their works. Um, and there are other things going on, too. Um, uh, this belief that, you know, everything the developing world does is beyond criticism because everything the West has done has been to oppress the developing world. So the, de so the West can do nothing right. The developing world can do nothing wrong. And Israel gives the lie to that. It gives the absolute lie to it every single day because Israel is innocent of what it's accused of. And the developing world, through the Arabs, is guilty of everything that the West doesn't even appreciate. And consequently, it has to deny Israel's victimization, because if it accepts Israel's victimization, it doesn't just have to rethink its entire narrative about the Middle East. It has to accept that its entire moral and political personality is fundamentally corrupt and wrong. It cannot do that. So it has to deny Israel. So that's how I see it. Okay, thank you. While we're on the topic of Israel, are you observing a similar downward spiral within Israel as you describe in Britain and the West? Or is it different? Uh, uh, my attitude to, I mean, I, I spend most of my time I, sp I spend most of my life now in Jerusalem, having never been to the place until the year 2000 and never wanted to go. I now spend most of my time now in Jerusalem, um, although I spend a great deal of time in Britain, so I never quite know what day it is or what continent I'm in, but that's another matter. Um, I have to say uh, that I, c I can almost not bear to look at what's going on in Israeli politics and Israeli culture because it's so agonizing to see. Um, it's a very different place from the West. It's in many ways very Middle Eastern. Um, people don't realize, people think in the West, you know, that it's, it's an outpost of the West in the Middle East. In a way it is, in a way it's not. Um, the things I've been describing this, this evening are certainly there in Israel. Um, they are almost entirely inside the universities. Um, and the political parties which kind of give expression to that way of thinking. Um, the vast majority of the Israeli public is uh, anchored completely in reality. Um, and 
Uh, there are other reasons why the Israeli intelligentsia has gone down this kind of road that I'm talking about. Uh, it's not simply that they are, I think, um, influenced uh, by the culture that's come out of the Western intelligentsia, uh, which, you know, carries all before it because it's the West. It's very powerful, culturally very powerful. But I think it's also mixed up with something that's darker and much more tragic, uh, which is this desperate desire of secular Israelis in particular to kind of eradicate the stuff in Israel which makes them different. And it's a terrible, tragic thing to see this. And you can understand why, because they want to remove what makes people hate them. And it's, it's so much easier to say, well, if only we can get rid of our terrible government, everything's going to be okay. Because it's so frightening to think that what you're up against is out there and it's millions of people and it's, 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 it's overwhelming. And they live there. They, they live it day by day by day by day. And I don't think any of us in the West can really appreciate the psychological pressures, not just day by day on people who are living there, but the cumulative psychological pressure on a country which was born in hatred and war, the hatred of the surrounding societies and war, which is never ending, never ending. And they look to the future, and if they're being realistic, they say, we can see no end to this. It's the status quo. We have to knuckle down. We have to get our heads down. And our children and our children's children will probably have to go to war again to defend ourselves. That's a terrible thing to live with. That does something to somebody. And so I think one has to bear that in mind when one reads the hysterical rantings of the Israeli intelligentsia, which are actually quite sort of bizarre. One has to bear that in mind. So it's, it's a, I think it's a complex picture. It's a tragic picture. Uh, the disorders of the West play a part, but there's other stuff going on as well. We now switch to the Catholic Church. So the Catholic, this question says the Catholic Church seems to be growing only in Africa and, and not elsewhere. And the question is, do you think the current Pope can turn around the situation and also suggest that he's um, not rejecting Judeo-Christian values? I, to be honest, I don't know enough detail about Catholicism to be able to answer this question properly. What I've seen of Pope Francis, I don't particularly care for. I think he's the problem, not the solution. Um, uh, I think some of his predecessors understood the, the problem much better, that uh, what's needed is for basically Europe to re-Christianize. Um, and uh, what, the, what the present Pope is doing is to basically try to accommodate everybody else, or particularly the world of Islam. Uh, to Christianity. Christianity, I'm not sure about Catholicism, but Christianity is certainly uh, increasing uh, in Africa and in China and in other parts of the developing world. And it's a very curious thing that, you know, in, in Africa you have, you know, you have Christians being burned alive in their churches uh, by radical Muslims. Um, and in those countries, Christianity is increasing exponentially. And as was explained to me uh, by uh, Christians that I talk to about this, um, who, who, who deal with this and think about this a lot, uh, the, the reason is, is quite simple. Um, without, you know, they, are, they are aware in, the, in Africa and the developing world that they are at such terrible risk from radical Islam. And they can't survive that risk. They can't defend themselves unless they attach themselves to Christianity. Um, and so... Um, you know, they are persuaded of the benefits of Christianity and that's why they are signing up in, in great number. Um, and they get spiritual sustenance from it and, you know, physical security. But it's mainly spiritual sustenance they get from it. They get from it the strength to continue. Um, and it's been said, you know, Christianity is changing its color. Uh, it's from be going from being white to being basically brown and black uh, because it's dying in Europe. Um, and it's increasing in the developing world. Uh, now, uh, how true that is, I don't know, but I think there's a sort of, there's a, a general point there which is well made. Okay. This is a question about a, a, a church here, I, I suppose, in Canada. It is starting a series of social justice programs. And the question, including racial issues, white supremacy, and the question is, 
essentially, what do you think about the idea of, a, of churches going down the road of social justice programs? Well, to me, social justice is an Orwellian term, meaning social injustice. Um, it's uh, uh, social justice is uh, another term for um, revenge against Western values. Um, and consequently, it stands for a negation of all the things that we hold dear, uh, while purporting to be uh, trying to promote them. And thus, it's completely mind-bending. And it's a great tragedy that churches are going down this road. It's not just churches, it's also certain denominations uh, in Judaism too. Um, this idea that uh, it's, 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 uh, this idea that the words mean what they say they mean is simply wrong, and it's twisted so many minds. As I said in my uh, remarks earlier, words like justice have been absolutely transformed. Um, justice means actually, in some uh, uh, areas uh, that, that you're al uh, alluding to, uh, justice has become a synonym for power, for taking power and using power against uh, people who you disapprove of. Um, it's not justice at all. It's a recipe for intimidation, harassment, bullying, extinction of freedom, extinction of free speech, um, and people of true religious faith who are truly possessed of conscience and the betterment of humanity uh, should have nothing whatsoever to do with it. I'm not sure what the lessons are for Canada um, from the um, descent into hell of the British Labour Party. Um, it's been ascribed to Jeremy Corbyn, uh, who, as you may know, is a far-left leader of the Labour Party. Um, uh, he is everything you read about, and the people around him are worse. And they are proceeding on the well-tried and tested revolutionary uh, doctrine that, you know, you capture the, um, the, uh, uh, the mechanisms of the party and you, 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 you hijack them and then you make it impossible for the party ever to recover. And they're in the process of doing that. Um, uh, and the anti-Semitism is part of that. But uh, in my view, um, it's exploded into the public domain recently and that's partly because of Jeremy Corbyn's own inability to deal with it, his own history, personal history of associating uh, with enemies of the Jewish people on public platforms and so on. So he's given a kind of, he's put sort of rocket fuel behind it. But I personally think it's a mistake to think it's all to do with Jeremy Corbyn. If, you know, if, if he were to be uh, somehow removed tomorrow and if the Labour Party were to revert to nice, cosy, Blairism, as it's called, a sort of, you know, middle-of-the-road Blairism, um, that it, everything would be fine in terms of anti-Semitism. Au contraire, um, this thing started under Blairism. Uh, and in fact, it didn't start under Blairism. It started before Blairism. Um, but it's, it's part and parcel of the left. It's what's happened to the left. It's, hap what's happened, it's, what happened to, it's what's happened to the progressive side of politics because we also have not just the Labour Party in Britain, we have what we call the Liberal Democrats, who are neither liberal nor democratic, but put that to one side. Um, and they are considered to be more, they were considered to be more to the left of the Labour Party. They come from a different tradition. Um, but uh, they're not, they wouldn't consider themselves to be socialist in any way. Um, but the Liberal Democrats are more rabidly anti-Israel than the Labour Party. In other words, it's all the people on the sort of, what would be called the progressive wing of politics, who have su succumbed to this sickness uh, of anti-Israelism. And uh, it's certainly exacerbated, it's made worse by having, you know, uh, an out-and-out -out revolutionary socialist at the, at the helm of the Labour Party. Uh, but the sickness is much broader and much deeper. Um, and it's in the progressive mindset, which is basically a universalizing mindset, uh, which basically, as I said in my remarks, 
um, is is anxious to um, to expunge really from uh, from the world uh, uh, the, the 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 basic tenets of the West. And that's what the left has. That's what the, the progressive world has turned itself towards in one way or another, even though they may not think of it in that way. And anti-Semitism is absolutely at the core of all of that because you know if you want to get rid of as i suggested in my remarks if you want to get rid of the core moral precepts and tenets and culture of the west you have to get rid of the jewish codes yeah, there are several questions that are more or less the same does sweden have a chance does france have a chance <laughs> does scandinavia have a chance <laughs> Well, I, 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 I'm flattered that you may think I'm a sort of encyclopedia of world knowledge, um, but I really am not. Um, look, are these, I mean, all I know is what I read. I, don't, I, you know, I haven't been to these countries, um, and I'm reading probably what you're reading. Um, and a situation Sweden, uh, in Sweden, in, the, the situation in France is absolutely dire. Uh, in Jerusalem, we hear French spoken increasingly, because so many French people are coming to Israel. Um, the level of violence against um, Jews in France is horrendous. Um, and uh, uh, part of that is the particular demographic, the particular kind of um, radical uh, Islamists they have there come from mainly from, Arab, from um, uh, North African uh, Arab countries, uh, relic of French colonialism, very, very violent dealt with in a particular way by France. Uh, French, you know, French society is very different from Britain, it's very different from Sweden. So these, these countries are all very different. And certainly in Sweden, I mean, I'm reading accounts of uh, the police chief in wherever it was, um, I've forgotten the, the, the city, but where there is, it's, it's not Malmo, it's, it's, um, it's another place, but where there is a very, very, very violent uh, large-scale violent Muslim population. The police chief says, you know, Sweden's over. Uh, we, we've lost control. We cannot do this. It's over. Help. Help, help, help. No one reports this. I mean, I'm reading it, but nobody, the mainstream media ignore it. So this is like desperate stuff, and the Jews are in, are in the center of this. I mean, the Jews are caught up in this. Um, and this is desperate stuff, and Britain is, 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 is very different. Um, Britain, you know, it's, it's, it's not a violent country. Um, and um, the anti-Semitism in Britain is at record levels, uh, which is tremendously worrying. It is no, nevertheless perfectly possible to be a Jew in Britain um, and not see any of this, uh, not register any of it at all. Uh, if you live in a Jewish area, you work in the Jewish area, your friends are all from the same Jewish area, you may go into town, uh, but you know, going into town, it's not, very, it's not dangerous. You can wear, even wear your kippah on the tube, nobody will knock it off. Um, you can go back to your home in the Jewish area. Um, you uh, don't particularly like Israel. You don't think about Israel. You don't care about Israel. Or you may actually subscribe to some of the views that Israel is just dreadful. So you tune out all the stuff about Zionism in Israel. You don't hear it. So what's the problem? And a lot of British Jews are like that. And I'm not sure that can be said of Jews in France and Sweden. But I don't know. It's possibly also true of Jews in France and Sweden. You know. People living in a country very often are the last people to see and understand what's, 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 what's going on. They don't have a sense of perspective, and maybe we don't have a sense of perspective either, because it is possible to live perfectly comfortably as a Jew in Britain at the moment. Um, so these things are difficult to, to, um, to generalize about. BDS. Is there anything we can do about BDS? Oh, um, well, BDS is a shorthand for um, <clears throat> uh, for the extreme anti-Israel animus uh, on campus and elsewhere. Um, and the point about BDS is that, in many ways, it's in its own terms, it's failed uh, because, you know, as I understand it, uh, trade between Israel and Europe is, you know, greater than ever before. And people, you know, people in the West, are, they cannot do without Israeli expertise, skill, genius in a whole variety of, 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 of areas. They can't do without it. So on that basis, it's failed, trade. 
uh, exchange of pro you know, products. Um, on, a, on, a, on a more local basis, certainly all I can talk about is Britain, um, there are uh, definitely uh, examples of people at a local level in university, uh, the Edinburgh Festival, uh, 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 barring um, Israelis uh, from participation. And some, sometimes this gets noticed, sometimes it doesn't. Um, and there are, you know, regularly uh, dreadful scenes in campus, on campuses, uh, uh, which is all part of the same thing. What can be done about it? Well, um, uh, the elephant in the room, I have to say here, is Israel. Um, you, can't be, you, can't be, you can't be more Catholic than the Pope. Uh, people in the diaspora can't defend Israel if Israel won't defend itself on those terms. And Israel does not make the case properly, in my view. He does not understand that what he's up against is not a question of Hasbara, PR. Uh, it's not a question of, of, of you know, doing social media better. This is all pathetic and ridiculous. What it's been up against for the last several decades is what's called PSYOPs, psychological operations, a psychological war. It's been the target of a psychological war waged with great shrewdness and great genius by the Arab side for four or five decades, um, backed by a huge amount of money with the intention of turning the entire narrative, which has done with enormous success. And Israel has just not been there and has not countered it. Now, Israel says we can't counter it because um, who cares about Europe? Who cares about Europe? We're trading with Europe, so who cares what they think? Um, we have America especially now, we have America, so who cares about Europe? What you think they say, what you think we're gonna change the views of Europe, what the graveyard of our people, what you think you're gonna change the views of people in Britain what, after what they did in Palestine under the mandate, what you think we're ever gonna have any kind of impact on these anti-Semites? They're anti-Semites, they were, they are, they will be. What do you want of us? We're busy fighting Iran and Hamas and the Hezbollah. Well, it's, it's, so that's, that's where we are. So they, they've not taken the fight to the enemy. And I say to them from time to time, um, uh, you could have an enormous effect if at a very high level, at a high volume, uh, you started saying some unpalatable truths. For example, the so-called friends of Israel in the British um, and European governments are actively aiding uh, a program which is devoted to racist ethnic cleansing, not one Jew in Palestine. What do you think, they, what do you think it means when it says settlers out without which we can't have a state of Palestine? You have to hold their feet to the fire publicly, uh, to which the answer is, what, you think that's gonna make any difference? It won't change a single view, to which I say this is completely wrong, because I know, or I think, that although there are true anti-Semites behind BDS, behind the animus against Israel, in Britain, the all I can talk about is Britain, um, the vast majority of people who subscribe to this terrible business of anti-Israelism just don't know, they don't know anything. They really, really, really believe that the indigenous people of Israel were the Palestinian Muslims who were there since time immemorial and that the Jews only came to Israel because as a result of Holocaust guilt, European Jews were plucked out of Europe after the Holocaust and planted in Palestine, a country to which they had absolutely no connection at all, from which they drove out the indigenous population been there since time immemorial and where they are continuing to try to drive out the remnant. That's what decent people in Britain believe. Why do they believe that? Because they're told it day in, day out, in universities, on the BBC, in media, everywhere. And the problem is, there is nobody telling them the opposite. The Jewish community is silent. The, the Jewish community is silent. The Jewish community is silent on this. Okay, so though, you know, if I was saying this in, in Britain, they would say, I stood up and said this, oh, hello. I mean, when I say it's silent, what I mean is there's no institutionalized mechanism for putting into the public domain the truth. And Israel is silent, silent, and I think if these truths and other truths, you know, Israel always behaves in accordance with law, it always has done, it has law on its side, it has law on its side in its inception, it has law on its side in the territories, it has law on its side in the wretched occupation, which is not an occupation under law. Israel doesn't ever say this. Nobody knows it. So if I were a British person, 
If I were a British person, a decent, upstanding British person, and I knew nothing about the Middle East, I knew nothing about the Jewish people, nothing about Jewish history, and I was told day in, day out, this mythology, I would also be pretty cheesed off with the Israelis. I would also be dis predisposed to think that what they're doing is terrible. I would believe that you know, they're acting against law. They're acting against justice. Because I'm a British person. I believe in law and I believe in justice. And I believe in helping people who are vulnerable. Because I'm British. I'm decent. Those people could be turned overnight, overnight by the right kind of campaign. So at least they would say, what did they say? Where did that come from? What are they talking about? And then, at the very least, there would be a row. And then, at the very least, people would say, oh, but I've never heard that argument before. Is it true? And then Pandora's box would be open, and out would come truth tellers. But that's not what's happening. And so that's the way you deal with BDS. You have to reframe the entire strategy. Stop defending Israel. Stop defending. Stop saying, why are you shouting at us? We're the victims here. Oh, we don't slaughter Palestinian children. We treat them alongside our children in Israeli hospitals. Everyone's going, oh, they shouldn't be there anyway. Don't, as soon as you defend yourself on territory that they are defining for you, you've lost. Don't defend, attack. These people have to be taken down. The people who are telling lies have to be taken down. And they have to be, we have to be, we collectively have to be proactive and telling people truths and telling people truths about the lies they are being told. We shouldn't be waiting to be told we're dreadful and then defending ourselves, then we've lost. We should be saying, we are telling you, you are dreadful, because you are believing this rubbish, you are pu putting out this rubbish, you are being duped, you are being told lies. That's what we should be doing. That is the way you deal with BDS. On that note, I think we'll wrap up. I think we're out of time. I want to thank you very much. We all tend to believe that we are in favor of tolerance and human rights and things like that. But we know that we sense that there's a dynamic that's twisting some of those ideas into intolerance. And you've described very well what that dynamic is tonight. Thank you very much. And also, as Many of us here have a certain emotional attachment to the Hebrew Bible, I think. It's very, and, and, and may have thought from time to time that we have to balance, re, uh, balance modernity versus our love of the Hebrew Bible. It's nice to know that it is actually, in fact, a very consistent story. So thank you. You've taught us a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you.